Ten years ago, Australia's Prime Minister apologized to a stolen generation of indigenous people for policies that systematically remove them from their families. But today, more indigenous children are being removed than ever before, leading some to ask, is this a new stolen generation? I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we investigate the crisis facing Australia's indigenous families and the systems meant to protect them. They may look like any happy Australian family celebrating a mother's birthday, but heartache isn't far beneath the surface. Helen Eason and her children have spent years torn apart. Way, I love I hope this for Helen. A good day. And it's like, good just to have these. I've done on 6,000 in the tank for this. Is this lemon? And for you to come to, Mum, and to be here. I love you so much. Like thousands of other Indigenous families, four of Helen's children were removed by child welfare. After a long legal battle, the family was reunited just over a year ago. They take your young from you, and you have so many taken. You are not whole. Even when they come home, as much as they're all there, all them pieces can never, ever be put back together. For 18-year-old Rain, the memories of being removed when he was 10 are still raw. One police officer grabbed me and my mum was trying to fight him and stuff. And how did you feel then? Uh, a bit upset. Upset, worried, scared. Did you have any sense of why they were taking you? No, not at all. You might say you've been kidnapped and taken somewhere you don't want to be. At first, Rain and his younger brother and sister were placed with the same foster carer. But his sister ran away and Rain was moved away from his brother. That's when my family not like being a family. Really, like ever since then, like we've all separated. <laughs> Sexually abused as a child and the victim of domestic violence as an adult, Helen suffers from bipolar disorder and was addicted to drugs. But Rain says he always felt loved. She was the mum, still there. Like, she didn't leave her for nothing. She was home. And you went to school? Yeah. I did, I would say, I didn't go to school every day, but I missed out a lot. Was there any time when you felt unsafe? No. Or uncared for? No. Is that the one you were holding in your photo? They were never in danger. I was always there. They were my babies too. And they will be till the day I die. Helen's mother told Child Welfare she was prepared to care for her grandchildren. I could have all, I've got 36 grandchildren. I could have all of them except my daughter's children in my home. When you'd ask them why am I unsuitable, they said, oh, we don't have to answer that. And it was, it was very, very hard. This was at one of the visits, and we just try and make everything as normal as possible and still like that family unit. Helen says she saw her children rarely when they were in care. So how many visits did you have with them? I was seeing Noah, as I said, the four times a year to two hours, four times a year. Trinity and Rain, I was a lot more luckier with. Um, I think it was fortnightly and then it went to monthly. So that would have been like a month before he was taken. And how were you at that stage? I was fine. I was still struggling with um, the marijuana, but as I said, I am was honest to, mm. to everyone. 
Four years after her other children were removed, her 15-month-old baby was taken. Things got crazy. I don't know. All I can remember is running to different people and just begging them, like, please don't take my baby. Like, why are you doing this? There's no need to take him away. Helen went into a downward spiral, she and the father of her two youngest children ending up in prison for drug crimes. It's wrong what they do. I understand, like, yeah, some, in some situations, kids should be taken, but before you do take them, try and help the people beforehand, before just ripping them out of the family. Australia has a dark history of forcibly removing Indigenous children from their homes placing them in institutions or with white families. They're known as the Stolen Generation. In 2008, the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd made an historic apology. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these our fellow Australians. The Prime Minister's speech was meant to heal the wounds of the past. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. What the story means, you can't do it again. A decade on, Helen Eason and her mother take to the streets of Sydney, leading a charge to stop Indigenous children being removed from their families. They started a now nationwide organisation called Grandmothers Against Removals. We're fighting for our baby that you still got out there. No more. We're not going nowhere. And we are going to bring your system down. They are our babies. On the 10th anniversary of the apology, optimism has turned to despair. In the past decade, the number of Indigenous children being removed from their families has almost doubled. And the numbers are now higher than ever in the country's history. Today, Aboriginal children are almost 10 times more likely to be placed in out-of-home care than non-Indigenous children. To me, stolen generation never ever stops. It's all been about genocide. It's, it's never been about the protection of the children. Almost 3,000 kilometres away in the central Australian town of Alice Springs, the child welfare crisis is dividing the large local Indigenous community. There's no point saying we're creating another stolen generation and stopping kids from being removed from really horrible circumstances. We've got the highest numbers of family violence, we've got the highest rates of, um, you know, child neglect and abuse. And, and this is why our children are being removed. That's a simple fact. And if we cannot recognise that and acknowledge that, we're not going to actually get around to fixing the problem because it starts with actually recognising that. Jacinta Price is an Alice Springs councillor and has ambitions to enter the national political arena. But her blunt message has drawn scorn and anger. Today, she's heading to court with her mother and father to get a protection order after a death threat. I've been called a sellout because my detractors basically think that I should remain quiet and I should um, just regurgitate the same old rhetoric and uh, view myself as a victim to white colonisation. Whereas I'd simply rather just be a human being and a woman who is more concerned about the, the welfare of uh, Aboriginal women and children. and. I guess I'm attacked because um, I speak a lot of the truth and these truths are really hurtful truths. Jacinta's family isn't immune to the problems faced by many Aboriginal families. At this Indigenous camp on the outskirts of Alice Springs, she and her mother introduce us to their kin. 
Auntie Julie looks after three children from their extended family, and another six are under the care of close family friend Marion. We can't identify the children for legal reasons. They were given to me because of their mum and, you know, their parents drinking a lot and, you know, neglecting these kids. Marion isn't a blood relative nor Indigenous, but lifelong bonds have made her just like family. They're all family and they all relate to each other. I've had him since he was a baby and they, they just sort of kept coming, one after the other, and I couldn't shut the door. Yeah, in their mum's case, like, we lost their mum to alcohol, we lost their um, mum's sister to alcohol. She was only in her 20s. The other sister, I had to ID her body in a, bar, in a, in a car crash. Yep. And, you know, they lost their grandfather mm. to alcohol as well. And, yeah, it's just... It's, yeah. it's a cycle, it just keeps going. Three of the boys living with Marion suffer from fetal alcohol syndrome. Their mother's heavy drinking during pregnancy has left them with hearing and spinal disorders, as well as cognitive and behavioural problems. They see the specialist every three months with their alcohol syndrome, they're on medication. But recently, the family was forced into mediation over one of the boys. After living with Marion's family in town for the past two years, some of his other relatives wanted him placed with them on a remote Aboriginal community. I spoke to the other nana about it and they said no, they want him to stay with you because when his mum was passing on her deathbed, she asked me to take him to bring him up with his sister. Yeah, and, and so that he had all the opportunities for him to have a, a good life and she didn't want him back out on community where there wasn't any services to deal with his health problems. I think we need more, more you know, women like Marion. <laughs> And I think we need to get past the point of, um, you know, separating us all from race and recognising that we're in fact human beings. And these children are human beings, they're Australian citizens and they deserve the same rights as any other child in this country. But we're putting their culture before their rights as human beings. And I think that's where the system is failing them. And of course the stigma that has been brought about because of the original Stolen Generation. Oh, I think it's a subtle extension of the stolen generation. So, Walter, what have you got? Jacinta Price's view is rejected by the local Tungandjira Council CEO, Walter Shaw. If you remove Aboriginal children from the Aboriginal community, you might as well shut down Aboriginal uh, communities. One could say that these children being placed into uh, the care and protection of welfare and the foster care arrangements with non-Aboriginal children is that they're being doctrinated uh, with values other than being Aboriginal people. Of the Aboriginal children in foster care, 40% are placed with non-Indigenous families. Walter Shaw says his council wants to change this and keep children in their communities. Kinship care for our organisation is an imperative. Oh, I think uh, we need to move to a system where we support Aboriginal families that are functional and strong Aboriginal families to become those foster carers. We, we've set up a family safety group that uh, are now talking sensitively around uh, all forms of violence, uh, community, domestic, you know, talking about the, the alcohol issue, the drug issue. But for 16-year-old Sarah, it's a case of too little, too late. She was born into a family plagued by drug and alcohol fueled domestic violence. There would be cups getting thrown, blood everywhere. Um, I'm getting bashed, obviously. And yeah, just, just real violent stuff. Sarah's mother, Denise, became involved with Sarah's father when she was 13 and he was 18. She says the Department of Children and Families, or DCF, placed her with her boyfriend's family despite their relationship. He beat me, like, real bad, like, a few t on a few occasions. And DCF was well aware of that. They had to take me to hospital a few times. I just felt like I was palmed off and left and forgotten about, yeah. 
and I didn't have the chance to leave that, the courage to even, or the support to leave that relationship right until I was 23, 24. Yeah. But when she escaped to Alice Springs with her three kids to live with her dad, she says she couldn't cope. And you could imagine, you know, living with your dad and he's beating his woman and there's drog, grog and everything in the house. I went to DCF office and I asked them for help and thinking that there would have been some kind of supports there, but there wasn't. The stress levels ended up getting higher there. Like, I couldn't really keep the kids under control. And so they were running amok and getting out of control. I then started to smack and hit my kids. She used to like come back drunk and we would be sleeping in the room and she'd come in and chuck cupboards at us. And I come back one day after school and um, me and mum was arguing. Yeah, she ended up vlogging me, giving me two black eyes and sent me to school the next day with two black eyes. For then seven-year-old Sarah, that led to almost a decade in residential care. It was all right at first when I was younger. And then later on down the track, it just was getting hard and I started understanding things a little bit more. And you can show me around town. Yeah. The suburbs of Alice Springs are littered with Sarah's former care homes. And how many, I mean, all together, how many places do you reckon you were in? 20 plus. In just 10 years? Mm-hmm. That's a lot of places. I could show you about six houses in this one little area. Of you know that story I was telling you about that boy and they used to lock us inside? As we pass another residential facility, the memories get worse. She says an assault by a care worker when she was 11 has left her traumatised. And then he just kept on looking at me funny ways, but I didn't think anything of it, you know, because I was young still, you know, and I didn't think anything of it. And then, um, yeah, he opened his legs and his fly was down, and I jumped up and I went to my room then. And then, um, I was just dozing off to sleep, you know, and as I was going to sleep, he walked in the room, closed the door, and that's, yeah. A year later, at another care facility, she says she was repeatedly abused by a boy a couple of years older than her. The time when I tried to um, smash his head in with um, a lamp, because it was wrong and, you know, he cares wasn't going to do anything about it, so I was just self-defending myself and carers never believed me and so I went off at the carers. And then I called Mum to come because they wouldn't believe me. The Department of Children and Families says it can't comment on individual cases but records show that almost 10% of children in out-of-home care in the Northern Territory are abused, neglected or exploited. For Sarah, it was a turning point. Her life spun out of control. She began running away from care homes, living on the streets or at her mother's and committing crimes. I felt safer out at the detention centre than what I did in care. Yeah, and then I just turned real heartless for a bit, for a while, and just did whatever I could to, to make a good reason to get locked up, you know? I just used to go break in and steal people's cars, and I just used to go bash people on the streets and everything. But now when I look back off that day, I just feel so bad for doing that all. She's told me some horrific stories about being, you know, abused by other residents, by workers, um, and just about um, complete lack of care for her as a human being. Tanya Collins was Sarah's lawyer at the height of her offending when she was about 12. Kids who are under the care of the minister then become kids in the criminal justice system very, very quickly and very, very closely. There's an interaction because often territory families lose track of the kids and which means they're basically left to their own devices for long periods of time. And that's how I got to know Sarah again a number of years later. 
and it was then the two developed an unexpected friendship. As her ex-lawyer, she'd come and see me and say hello and, um, you know, we had a good relationship. She obviously wasn't being supported by Territory families. She had um, a very difficult home life. You know, things that we all take for granted she wasn't having. Um, and so I started to sort of pay for her food every day and buy her clothes and, you know, try and support her. Yeah, I just started real liking her and she just started liking me. And we just bonded together and then, um, yeah, she wanted to foster me and do all this stuff for me. Sarah moved in with Tanya, but it wasn't to be. It was very challenging because um, you hope that you can be the person who can save someone or deliver them a, a better life, um, and, but the reality is that's not, it's not as clear cut as that. When I was on the streets, you know, only rules I followed was my rules. I didn't have to listen to anyone else because I was on the streets, you know, no one cared about me. And then she stepped in and then wanted to care for me and everything. And it was just hard to click straight on to the routines again. Yeah, I just found, I just found it difficult. I couldn't cope. Sarah went back to live at her mother's place with her boyfriend and extended family. Dysfunctional, traumatic, unsustainable, um, difficult. Um, yeah, it's not great. Um, no, it's not good. Sarah's mother continues to struggle with drug and alcohol addiction. Today she's at court for a number of assault charges and for being intoxicated while on bail. I'm not a person that drinks every day or every week and all that sort of stuff. But there have been occasions in the past where it has led to violence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with me and my ex, yeah. But not with my kids. I, I don't beat my kids when I'm intoxicated and stuff like that. They say you do. Yeah, but I don't. <laughs> There's a big difference, yeah. Yeah, every time that I've hit my kids, I've been sober. I haven't been intoxicated or anything like that. Sarah turns up at the court, but she's not happy about it. She wants me to stand up in court and tell the judge that she shouldn't go to jail. So I reckon she should go to jail. My point of view, after everything she's done to us, you know, she can't keep getting away with it. She keeps saying she's going to change, but yet last night she was drinking, doing the same old Her mother gets a reprieve, but is told she needs to do a rehabilitation program. I know she won't. And that's why I was just looked at the judge and I was like, what the hell, are you really going to do this? And yeah, I don't know. How does that make you feel to think that she's not going to go and do rehab? I don't care, it's her life. If she want to get help, she can get help. If she doesn't, she doesn't. I'm not the one suffering, her, she is. Because so. she has now got that maturity to actually say, OK, this is not about me anymore, it's about my mum. My mum has got her own problems, she's got her own issues. Um, and I can make myself have a better life and I don't want to repeat those mistakes. Um, and that's a really compelling and a, a wonderful thing to see in Sarah in that from someone who used to be known in this town as probably, you know, the number one um, disliked youth offender to have turned her life so around now. Sarah's not been in trouble for more than three years. She's now her own guardian and remarkably has started a police cadetship. They may not live under the same roof, but she and Tanya continue to have a strong bond. She is like my mother. In my eyes, my mother is Tanya, not Denise. Because Tanya's done a lot more for me and helped me a lot more than what mum has. She has, she's a good role model. Tanya has been Sarah's angel. I don't know where Sarah would be now without her. I am so grateful for really if I could give her my heart I would give it to her. <laughs> she came along and did something I couldn't do. Yeah. 
my past is never going to leave me, you know, it's always going to be there with me. I just got to learn to cope with it. I just got to learn to say, oh well, that happened to me, deal with it, move on. That's what I, that's what I try and do. It does get hard, but I try. Sarah may have survived a broken family and a dangerously flawed child protection system, but the sorry fact remains that a decade on from the government's apology to the stolen generation, Indigenous children are increasingly at risk. <laughs>